we'd like to begin with a small experiment, if I can have my two assistants, please. What we want to do is find out something about how we make decisions about uh, drugs. And so, on your left, this young doctor has Make You Well. And as you can see, Make You Well is an antipyretic, so it will reduce fever, reduces inflammation, and it's also an analgesic. Taken by mouth, however, it can cause problems in your gastrointestinal tract, uh, stomach bleeding, it can also cause problems in your ears. And for children and adolescents, this drug, unfortunately, may cause something called Ray syndrome. Ray syndrome affects um, particularly the brain and the liver. It's usually fatal. It's quite rare, but sadly, we've not been able to work out who is likely to get it. So it's, we can't actually discriminate before, between who might get it if they take Make You Well. On your right, however, we have another drug. And this, this young doctor has discovered On Demand. And On Demand, as you can see, this is very good for coughs and colds. It can also be used for headaches, a sedative. Um, and it's been used widely to treat anxiety, tension, headaches, insomnia. And it has been found, however, that if you take it for a long time, you might develop uh, peripheral neuritis, um, inflammation of the nerves, loss of function of the nervous system. So, in the periphery. So, what we want you to do is to decide, would you, based on this information, take either of those drugs? So we have Make You Well and On Demand, and we want you to vote. And unfortunately, the team here at the Centre of Cell are colourblind. They couldn't distinguish between red and green, so we've got cards that are yellow and white. So if you want to vote for Make You Well, will you hold up a yellow card? And if you want to vote for On Demand, will you hold up a white card, please? And my young assistants will distribute some medicines while you vote, and two other people will come and count you. So please hold your cards up, yellow or white cards, high please, so we can see. Okay, so those of you who voted for Make You Well, so this is the problem with Make You Well, and there are 22 of you who voted for that. Well, what you have taken, you've taken aspirin. So that's pretty good. Now, rather more of you, or slightly more, took, voted for white, on demand, and you have taken thalidomide. And just by that response, I think, means that you know what thalidomide is. Um, and I'm going to come back to thalidomide and aspirin later. The next slide, we have, nowadays we live in a very drug-orientated world. We're, we're swamped with drugs, with the idea of medicines, whether we go to the doctor for prescription, nip into boots for our aspirins, our benelins. I've just come out, got over a bad cold, so benelins and beechams are very much on my mind at the moment. But we expect, wherever we get our drugs from, we expect them to be safe and we expect them to be, fe be effective. But these are quite new, very recent, con uh, recent expectations that's been f uh, fulfilled. And the next slide just lists the four drugs I'm going to concentrate on today. And you'll have realised from the way I'm speaking, I'm using the word drugs and medicines interchangeably. I'm not implying by those words that someone is illicit or wrong. I'm using them in the medical sense where we use these words together all the time. The next slide, um, I do want to make a comment that it has been said that the thing that distinguishes man from all other animals is man's desire to take medicines. And every civilization, every culture that has been discovered, there's always been some evidence of, me of medicine making and medicine taking. On this slide, on the, no, the next slide, please, right, that's it. On the left here, this is a Greek papyrus from about 400 AD. And this is the earliest known um, work describing medicinal plants. It's a herbal describing plants that we use to make medicines for. But we do know from records and accounts that look at the using medicines goes back even earlier. For example, 2,000 years before this time, in ancient Egypt, a key post in the pharaoh's um, court was the keeper of the royal rectum. <laughs> 
Now, if you don't know what your rectum is, it's very close to the bits of you that you're sitting on. <laughs> um, the keeper of the royal rectum had charge of enemas and suppositories. He was, keep, he was clearly designed to keep the pharaoh regular. And he was, in fact, almost regarded as a priest in purifying the pharaoh, which he undoubtedly did. On the right, this is a 17th century apothecary, an itinerant drug seller. You can see if you look at him, he's, um, he's got a, um, a, a, a pestle and mortar there for compounding dr drugs and herbs. He's got um, alembics full of vinegar and alcohol and alkali. He's got herbs around his, uh, on his sleeves and everything. He's carrying the tools of his trade and he's making drugs as he travels around. We move to the 20th century. Things were not much different. There were still so-called pill peddlers going around to marketplaces, selling drugs, selling their nostrums. Then they would move on to the next marketplace. So they would be far away if any problems had arisen with those medications. But there was a growing band of more professional chemists, druggists and apothecaries who would compound medicines, usually following precise formulae, often in the back of their apothecary shops, and especially if they were members of the apothecaries, the Society of Apothecaries, they were properly licensed to dispense medicines. Although, as with any trade, any profession, there were always the irregulars. And here, on the right, you see somebody, this, amazingly he's called John Heaven, and he's actually uh, an apothecary, but he's also an undertaker which I think in one parlance would be um, expressed as a conflict of interests. <laughs> now, one of the key stimuli in the development of trade in this country, and which includes drugs and medicines, was this. The first steam engine. Railways actually covered this country. This is a map of the railway network, circa 1900. You can see the vast extent of the railways going deep inside and deep into the, the country and so much convergence onto London. And what the railways did was they meant that the local became national. Raw materials didn't have to, have to be used and manufactured used locally. They could be transported to a factory somewhere else and used in manufacture. And, fi and the finished goods could also be transported around the country and indeed outside the country internationally. This movement of goods, so that wasn't just dependent on the local reputation, led to the development of brand names. So the goods, the goods you bought in Edinburgh were the same as the goods you bought in Cornwall. They were branded with the same name. And at the same time, the railways encouraged the movement of newspapers. Newspapers which would travel very quickly around the country, not as on a stagecoach, but actually could get from London to York in one day, and newspapers carried adverts. And these adverts, these are actually for drugs, and these are from, from quite respectable medical journals. If you look at the one on the left, lion ointment, amputation avoided. It should remind you what a tough life it was. This is about 1880, this, this um, uh, advert. It's still largely agricultural country, there was so, but agricultural accidents or mining accidents or factory accidents were really very difficult to cope with. There were very few drugs, no, few painkillers, no antibiotics, nothing to, to help an infection, no safety regulations. So an accident really might mean amputation of a limb. Or, or worse even, it could mean death. So here we have a medicine that is promising, this is an absolute cure-all. Actually, what it works out as, this is actually um, an analysis of this taken by the British Medical Association, showed that it was actually made of white lead and turpentine. So it wasn't going to do much good. Let's say it does remind you of how tough life was. In fact, life expectancy in 1900, a baby boy born in 1900, would on average live for 47 years. And the baby girl born that year would live for 52 years. Very different from nowadays. And big killers 
Well, the infectious diseases. Nothing to combat infectious diseases. So pneumonia, diphtheria, typhus were rampant. And of a thousand babies born, 160 would die before their second birthday. On the right-hand side, these are not the kind of adverse we would expect to see in medical or pharmaceutical journals, but beef wine, bovril, cocoa, well, they probably weren't going to do any harm, and they might actually help a malnourished patient fight infection, fight disease, or at least just boost them up and be a tonic. Next slide, please. The modern world of pharmaceuticals was really beginning at the end of the 19th century with the coming of pharmaceutical industry. This is Bayer's, and Bayer, we've already mentioned them, perhaps their most famous product, aspirin, that appeared in 1899. And what Bayer did, they started, this is a lab in Germany, this is a company in Germany, they started research labs, which you can see at the top right, so they would investigate and purify and standardize the medicines they made, <coughs> and they then packaged them in very sterile factory conditions. Not like that apothecary at the back of his shop making medicines. This was now large-scale safe production. <coughs> Next slide. Aspirin was advertised very widely. And indeed, it is the ma still the major selling drug of all time around the world. This is an advert in medical press. This is 1906. <coughs> Anybody notice anything unusual? <laughs> heroin, yeah, advertising heroin. Can you imagine it? Well, why not? Heroin had been discovered to be a, um, what they thought at the time, a safe alternative to morphine. What they decided, what it was marketed for, was uh, particularly as a painkiller. It wasn't believed to be addictive in any way, and it was continued to be prescribed until 1920. And indeed, a lot of conventional medicines had ingredients which make us look askance a little. The next slide, for example, shows us Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola, when it started, really was the real thing. It did contain cocaine. And therefore, no wonder it had the drink with dash, vim and vigor. <laughs> and on the right here, Tabloid Forced March. This was a very respectable medicine produced by Boas Welcome and Company. And if you read what it contains, it contains pure caffeine and pure cocaine mixed together. It says it should allay, allay hunger and prolong the power of endurance, which with those ingredients it undoubtedly did. Next slide shows uh, another unusual ingredient, perhaps cannabis. Cannabis has been used as a medicine for centuries and again was prescribed well into the 20th century, as shown on the left-hand side. It's now making a comeback as an authorised licensed medicine. On the right, these are um, capsules of Sativex. This has just been licensed in 2011 as a, as a drug for a treatment of um, multiple sclerosis, for the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. And the people who make this, this one company, GW Chemicals, they grow cannabis plants in very controlled, ex very controlled circumstances, so they can't have any bird droppings on them, and this, the soil composition is well known, etc., etc., etc. So they can produce a very um, precise, standardised medicine. So uh, we've got a big question today about miraculous medicines or malevolent molecules. But I'm going to ask you a small question. Given the range of things you've just seen and the adverse you've seen, what do you think this very, you know, very serious scientific gentleman, what do you think he's advertising? This is from the turn of the 20th century. This is late. This is about 1895. And so you can see there's a lot of scientific apparatus and he's looking very serious got a way of books behind him. So I want you to think about this, and we'll come back to this at the end of the talk. What do you think he's advertising? Before 1925, lots of these compounds, lots of these drugs available, but there was very little safety. The laws and regulations there were usually related to the supply and sale of, of any kind of product. So we have 
Weights and Measures Acts, Poisons Acts, Pharmacy Acts, the Sale of Food and Drugs Act, but none of these related to the safety and the efficacy of the end product. By and large, regulation such as it was, was left to the manufacturers themselves. And I think nowadays we are rather suspicious of the idea of self-regulation. But at the time, many of the, the big pharmaceutical companies, and there weren't very many, actually found it of commercial advantage to be able to say that their drugs, their medicines were standardised, were purified, that they had been through the rigour of laboratory testing. And this is an advert from an American company, Park Davidson Company, who sold drugs in this country. And just looking through some of the, you can't see it very well, some of their leading specialties, there are items listed there which would strike us as odd in a list of pharmaceuticals as toothpaste, soap, face cream. And there's this thing, ergot. Ergot was used for obstetrics in obstetrics to speed up labour. It had been used for centuries by wise women and midwives, never not really caught on with the medical profession until the end of the 19th century. As you can see here, very respectable pharmaceutical company advertising ergot. Ergot comes from, ergot is actually a, it's a funny little thing, it's a fungus that infects cereal plants that grow in cool um, damp climates, such as wheat and rye. So here is this funny little fungus that produces a drug that is used in obstetrics. But it also produces other drugs, like one of which causes gangrene um, and can cause limbs to fall off. So if by chance people eat bread made with rye or wheat flour that's contaminated with uh, this fungus, this ergot, they get a terrible disease called ergotism. And the next slide is an account of a very rare case of ergotism in this country. And this is from um, 1762. And this is an account of a girl called Mary Wetherset, who was 16, and she lived in Bury St Edmunds. Her father is a farm labourer, and this is an account of Mary, her mother, and her four siblings who get ergotism. And Mary starts off, she gets a pain in her leg. It won't go away, and the leg starts getting inflamed, and it gets very sore, and um, she describes it as, as if dogs are gnawing them. It is so painful. The blackness of the gangrene spreads up her leg, and unfortunately, the surgeon tries to amputate her leg um, at the knee which is very painful and is not really very successful. The gangrene continues up her leg and the other leg becomes afflicted. And here you can see that the leg, the, actually the foot becomes mortified, the skin becomes dead, and actually the foot falls off at the ankle because it's so rotten as the leg then is amputated again near the knee. Poor Mary continues to live for another few weeks Unfortunately, I think, considering her suffering, she dies. Her mother and her four siblings all survive, but all of them have one or both legs amputated. So this is an account of poisoning from a, a drug that is actually also has a beneficial use, but this is accidental poisoning. At the time, they could also get deliberate ad adulteration and contamination, of many medicines. I already described the lion's ointment. There was a quack medicine, was made up of very dubious ingredients. Sequoia was a company at the end of the 19th century which was incredibly successful. They used to take over the whole of um, Clapham Common, for example, and have Wild West shows. Sequoia was supposed to be an Indian, and the medicines they produced were North American native remedies. There were universal elixirs. There were universal medicines that would cure everything. And there's a lot of complaints, particularly in the British Medical Association, about this company. Um, and they analysed the, the, this universal elixir, and that was found to contain turpentine, alkali, and weak alcohol. This obviously had no beneficial um, effects whatsoever.
Eventually, the company was closed down. It was prosecuted. But sadly, it was because of income tax irregularities, not because of the problems with their drugs. The British Medical Association and the, Society of Pharmace the Pharmaceutical Society both mounted campaigns against what was called palatable poisons for the poor. This is actually, this um, cartoon actually comes from an American journal because the same thing was happening in America. The pharmacists and some of the doctors were really objecting to this flood of really fake and fraudulent medicines. In America, this resulted, the campaigns resulted in the passing of the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906. But in this country, there was no legislation. And indeed, it wasn't until 1921 when these two men in Canada made a discovery that did prompt some legislation. On the right, this is Frederick Banting. And on the left, young medical student, not much older than most of you here, uh, they discovered insulin. They discovered a treatment for diabetes. Now, you may know that diabetes is a disorder of the pancreas. It doesn't secrete natural insulin. And insulin is involved in carbohydrate metabolism. So if you can't metabolize, metabolize carbohydrates properly, you get a buildup of sugar in the body. So the only treatment was actually to put patients, and they're usually children, on a very, very low calorie diet. This is Elizabeth Hughes. She was 13 in 1922, and she'd been diagnosed with diabetes nearly two years earlier. You can see she's almost a walking skeleton. She was one of, she lived in Toronto, as where Banting and Best worked, and she was one of the first people to be given insulin. The picture on the right is of Elizabeth, just a few months after receiving her, her insulin um, uh, therapy. You can see what an amazing difference it made, bringing her back to life. Elizabeth Hughes died in 1981. She'd married, she'd had children and got grandchildren, and indeed one great-grandchild by then. And it was reckoned that she'd had over 50,000 injections during the course of her life of insulin. This, the insulin, the, the arrival of insulin, prompted some limited legislation. And this was the Therapeutic Substances Act of 1927. And it applied to the control of biological substances such as insulin. It was very, very limited in what it applied to, but this was the first real legislation for therapeutic products in this country. So, insulin. It's this important drug. It, convert, it, it transformed diabetes from being a fatal condition into a chronic condition that could be managed with insulin. So we might well say that it's on, it's on the miraculous end of the spectrum that I've given you, which I think is probably true, but it wasn't entirely without problems. Trying to manufacture this new drug cre created a lot of, of problems in factories. There was no experience of making this kind of new biological product. There was contamination, trying to the supply problems. Most of the insulin was made from beef cattle, the pancreas of beef cattle. There were supply, pro supply problems in this country in the early 1920s. Occasionally there was contamination. And there was also always the problem of trying to work out the correct dosage of insulin. Sometimes people were underdosed, sometimes overdosed, often both of which would have, could have fatal consequences. And indeed, that does happen today if diabetics get their, their insulin dosage wrong. Next slide, please. The next big push in drug safety, the next drug I'm going to talk about, is penicillin, which was the result of an observation made by this man. This is Sir Alexander Fleming, who was a bacteriologist working at St Mary's. Now, as a bacteriologist, he grew cultures of bacteria in a Petri dish like this. And the story goes that he'd left his Petri dishes out one day, he'd been away on holiday, and one of them got contaminated with a spore of a fungus, a fungus actually called penicillium. And in the area around this spore, the bacteria had died. This Petri dish was not full of bacteria like this one, there was actually an area. 
where the, the bacteria had been killed. Now work by Oxford chemists in particular tried to discover what that chemical was that the mould actually uh, produced. And the next slide shows that some of the work that was done or some of the, the, the techniques that they had to adapt. Penicillin would only grow on um, a flat surface and this was now we were coming up to the time of the Second World War. There was no suitable provisions in this country. So before they actually devised a proper insulin, uh, sorry, penicillin fermentation vessel, they used bedpans and all bedpans were commandeered around the country to become fermentation vessels for penicillin. And if you don't know what a, f what a bedpan is, you might talk with the people who didn't know what a rectum was afterwards, because you might have a lot in common. The next slide shows, this is wartime, this is a picture of wartime, and actually there are bedpans over here, and insulin, uh, insulin penicillin fermenting flasks over here. This is actually a picture taken in the uh, factory of a company called Glaxo, which I'm sure you've heard of. This was one of five companies that had the industrial capacity to try to make penicillin in the Second World War. There were only five companies in this country, and they united all their efforts to form the Therapeutic Research Corporation just to produce penicillin. Next slide, please. So penicillin and the supply of penicillin and the purity of penicillin became a priority for legislation. It was, it was a wonder drug because it killed bacteria. Finally, there was something that would cure people with some of these infectious diseases. In the Second World War, it could get people, it could help uh, people in the battlefield, it could get troops back to the front. And so in 1947, there was a first major legislation for, called the Penicillin Act. So there's now a second piece of legislation. We've got the Therapeutic Substances Act and the Penicillin Act. And for the, over the next few years, these two acts were revised and refined. But there were still just these two acts. Let's return to thalidomide, which I've mentioned. Oh, sorry, <coughs> antibiotics. No, next slide, please. Antibiotics. So, antibiotics, obviously good drugs, aren't they? They're on the miraculous end. Mm, could be, but you've all heard of antibiotic resistance. The overuse of penicillin and other drugs like penicillin, antibiotics, has led to particular problems with antibiotic resistance. But simply, the bacteria that an antibiotic doesn't kill are the ones that are resistant. They're the ones that go on to reproduce. And so this is a problem as the, as the, bac the antibiotic resistance bacteria that continue to reproduce. So drug companies are constantly trying to find antibiotics that will kill different kinds of bacteria. And it's a constant tension between the bacteria and the drugs. And very recently, the chief medical officer, lots of medical experts have been saying, we are really on the cusp, we're at a tipping point with antibiotics. We may well lose antibiotics, all antibiotics, in the next 20 years. And antibiotics are not just something for when you've got um, a cut or an infection. Antibiotics are used widely, for example, post-operative conditions, transplantation, a wide array of surgery, surgical procedures depend on having backup from antibiotics. So there's now a serious problem with antibiotics. Next slide. We now go back to thalidomide, which you all groaned at before when I mentioned it. And yes, this is sort of the ultimate horror drug, isn't it? Next slide. Yeah. Babies born in the late 1950s, early 1960s with horrendous, horrendous deformities of limbs, often no limbs, just buds where they um, say no um, arm but just a, a hand. Horrible, horrible deformities. And this horror around the world made drug companies sit up and think, right, we have to have forms of legislation, as did governments, of course. And in Britain, in, um, sorry, just change a uh, slide bit. Um, this drug, thalidomide, was um, marketed under the name Distaval. And it was reckoned to be completely safe. There was no way they could, no one had actually reported any toxic effects. This is why it was used so widely. It was regarded as so safe. So it was, uh, it was an absolute shock when the, the, these abnormalities, these horrendous problems arose. 
And this is when drug legislation in this country really came to the fore. And this was the Medicines Act of 1968. This had, th amongst another, a number of other um, um, uh, conditions, if, if impo it said that all manufacturers had to be licensed and open to inspection. Up to that stage, anybody could make a drug and market it. So everybody had to be licensed with the, the Medicines Commission and their premises had to be open to inspection. Drugs had to be labelled and advertised, if they were allowed to be advertised, in a very careful way. No extravagant claims and all the ingredients of the drug clearly recognised. No magic ingredients, nothing like that. And another key point that's often overlooked, drug representatives, drug reps who go round to hospitals, to doctors, to drug companies, they had to have, be given a basic salary. They were not, they were not expected to, get their, to earn their living by pushing drugs. They should, their, well, their remuneration should not be directly related to the drugs they sold. And this, sorry, you go, this legislation, the 1968 legislation, remains in force today. It's been modified, it's been updated, it's been harmonised with European legislation, but this, Medicines Act 68, is still what still informs the drug safety regulation of this country. So, from what I've just said to you, thalidomide, well, clearly, this is a bad molecule. This is on the other end of the of that spectrum, isn't it? You won't be surprised to hear me say, not quite. Next slide, please. Thalidomide has been found to be a tremendous drug for treating various kind of skin cancers, and in particular, for treating leprosy. Leprosy is a particularly appalling, terrible uh, bacterial drug, a uh, bacterial disease. In fact, I've been I was advised by the team not to show you any pictures of leprosy patients because they, 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 people get skin lesions, they have effects on their nervous system, they can get all sorts of deformities and disabilities. The pictures are not very nice. Here we do have a leprosy patient being treated, you can see with leg ulcers, and skin problems, and also problems with their, 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 their feet there. But thalidomide actually helps patients to um, cope with their symptoms. It doesn't cure, the, thali cure the, uh, the leprosy, but it does provide symptomatic relief. So in limited circumstances, in countries where leprosy is prev prevalent, particularly in India and in Brazil, thalidom next slide, sorry, thalidomide is still being sold. And this is the packaging that was used in Brazil for many years. And it's quite clear how you should take it. And it actually says that women of childbearing age should not take it. Unfortunately, in, an Ill, in, a, in a population where there are a number of illiterate people, this was misinterpreted and it's recognised that women shouldn't take, an, take it, it was assumed that this might be a drug that would bring on an abortion. So a lot of women took this drug, thinking it would bring on an abortion, so they were, early, they were pregnant very early on, they took this drug, and the result, next slide please, the result is that there are now babies in Brazil with these horrible thalidomide deformities that the world thought they would never see again. And now the drug packaging, which you can see here, they do actually have horrendous pictures of some of, the th 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 of some of the thalidomide babies that have been born more recently. So, the question I posed, medical marvels or malevolent molecules? Well, I haven't really helped you come to a, a clear uh, consensus of an answer, and indeed I don't think there is one. I've talked about some very powerful drugs that have good effects, bad effects, some drugs that can be easily misused, then drugs that have really bad effects and may then be found to have good effects. It's not a clear-cut answer as to how drugs in themselves are good or bad. It's often how they're used, the conditions they're used in, and what they're used for. So I just want to acknowledge the, the team who are all dressed up, who have helped in guiding me in picking pictures. Katie and Ross from Centre of Cell and my team Adam and Alan, Adam who has been driving the slides, 
And I want to go back to the small question I asked. What is he advertising? What's he doing? Any, if you actually do know, don't shout out at the moment, but if you don't, what do you think is going on here? Andrew's liver sauce. Yeah? Okay? Not? Urine. Testing urine. That's a good, good idea, yes, looking for clarity of urine, yes. That's, uh, we've got Andrew's liver sauce, no idea, and testing urine. Anything else? Anybody else? Urine as well. Urine? Okay, we've got two votes for urine. Whiskey? Sorry? Whiskey? Whiskey. <laughs> actually, you know, the BMJ and the Lancet have appeared, yeah, there were adverts for whiskey. That's not actually a whiskey advert, but yeah, adverts for whiskey and sherry, things like that. Actually, cigarettes as well. Look at the BMJ, are really up until about the 1930s, so that was the cigarette, the kind of cigarette you should be smoking as a doctor. Vinegar. Vinegar? Yeah. Yeah, yeah we're going to, so we've got quite a range. Well, the next slide will actually show you what this is. I don't know if you can see. It's Cadbury's cocoa. <laughs> but, you know, look at that image. So there's a microscope and there's all sorts of chemical apparatus. There's burettes there and measuring cylinders and all these books. Cadbury's Cocoa. When I showed this to my students, and I see there's a former MA student who may have seen this some time ago, <laughs> um, somebody actually said to me, what's Charles Darwin doing? <laughs> <laughs> so, any questions? I've got some people who've got microphones, because you probably realise I'm hard of hearing, so young people will bring you a microphone if you want to ask a question. One of the problems with the drugs being malevolent molecules is how we find out about the side effects. Mm. And that is quite complicated, isn't it? Because with the lizomide, there was a not very good story, yeah. I understand it. Yeah. But with some of the other drugs, even with all the testing on animals and, and all the other things, then these things come out very late on and in very rare numbers of people. So in the future, are we going to be able to deal with that in some way, do you think? You know, understand the people who suffer with those? It's a very difficult question because what you're actually asking about is risk-benefit analysis. When, at what point do we say, right, there's a risk we're prepared to take to get the benefit of this drug. And if we go for completely risk-free drugs, then it may well be that we're not going to have really good drugs as well. There are some ways, under the 1968 Medicines, um, Safety of Medicines Act, one of the um, subcommittees that was set up for, to report to government, which still exists, is the Adverse Drug Reaction Committee. And what they have is they have a system of so-called yellow cards. And doctors, if they have a patient having a strange reaction to a drug or a combination of drugs, fill in the yellow card, send it to the Central Medicines Commission, who are supposed to co correlate all the adverse reactions. And so this post-marketing uh, post surveillance almost should pick up later effects. But you're quite right, it's already happened by then. But I think the problem is going to be, where do you draw the line? Um, and I think that's a problem that drug companies are battling with around the, around the world. And it's often a battle between the legislation, legislators who think it should be all clear cut. You should be able to say whether it's good or bad. And people in the field who say, well, it's not that clear cut. And sometimes patients, because patients' voices and patients' demands sometimes say, OK, we know there's a risk with this medicine, but it's going to improve our quality of life. We want it. So there's a lot of different factors involved in that equation. And I don't think, I don't think anybody's got the answers how it's going to be resolved. So on one of the first slides, you showed uh, heroin next to aspirin. In what ways is heroin so still used? Or what benefits of heroin if it is still used as a drug today? I don't think it is still used as a drug today. Does anybody know? If I don't think it is used as a drug. I, I, didn't, did, I didn't mean to imply that heroin was still used. Uh, so my name is Samson Williams. I'm a second slash third year medical student here at Boston London. Um, to my knowledge, I think it is still used in rare cases um, uh, for pain relief. It's kept um, in sort of very secure conditions in uh, hospital pharmacies um, alongside other controlled drugs. What would be the conditions you'd have to use heroin in, do you know? Um, so I'm, I don't know for certain because I've never seen it being prescribed myself. Mm. Um, I imagine uh, the conditions that you would prescribe of other opiates like morphine for... Um, so it's some sort of painkiller of last resort or something? Yes. Think? Yeah. yeah, to my, to my knowledge. Yeah, thank you.
Um, so you've shown us lots of things from the history of medicine and lots of things that seem completely bonkers, like anyone being able to license and create a medicine and lions curing amputation and things like that. Um, what do you think people in 300 years time will think of today's medicine? Do you think there's things that they'll think are bonkers or do you think that they'll think, yeah, they were getting there? I certainly think they'll think our overuse of antibiotics was bonkers. Um, and the way that antibiotics are prescribed so freely. That is something, I mean, people think that's crazy now, but still, it still happens. And actually, antibiotic overuse, it's not just a medical use, it's veterinary use. The very early on, um, antibiotics were being given to cattle, to chickens, part of, you know, actually um, factory farming of chickens. If you crowd a lot of chickens together, they get diseases. So if you're going to crowd a lot of chickens together and give them antibiotics, they don't get the diseases. So overuse of antibiotics, I think, is the one thing that would really, um, I think, um, uh, people would think was bonkers. The other problem we, I think that is current and is going to be, uh, be an increasing problem and people in the future are going to look at and think, hang on, what were they doing, is access to medicines. Because, you know, we are in the first world we are talking about some really sophisticated and very expensive drugs. A lot of the world doesn't have access to basic drugs, doesn't have access to clean water, let alone basic drugs. And the WHO, the World Health Organization, has a list of essential drugs. You know, I think there are something like 42. Somebody who's a modern pharmacology student might be able to tell me precisely how many, but it's something like 42 drugs that they consider absolutely essential. Um, and a lot of people don't even have, have access to those. So we're talking about, you know, fine, we've got really sophisticated anti-cancer drugs. We're talking about drugs for lifestyle diseases, so drugs for obesity, drugs for anti-smoking, <laughs> things like that. Sh is that what we should be doing? So I think that in the future generations may well look back on that, uh, what we're doing and think, hey, they were crazy. This film may well survive, and you know, in 300 years, somebody's going to be showing this thing. Look at that daft old woman. What was she talking about? Um, I was just wondering, because looking at the picture on the board, um, you can see it's using science to sell something. And that I was just reminded me of particularly um, beauty products and shampoos and all these things that um, use science to sell things and they make claims they make these similar claims and just wondering how much regulation is there around that how much can you claim something the scientific properties of something and almost medicinal properties of something um where perhaps it's not actually a medicine or maybe not as scientific as they claim do you have a particular example just thinking about things like um so like face creams and anti-wrinkle creams, that yeah. sort of thing, yeah. where my understanding is a lot of what they do is it's a molecule that just stretches out the skin. It doesn't actually necessarily um, repair mm. collagen. But do they have, if they're making that claim, does it have to actually do what it says? The, or? That, things like face cream, um, that is actually covered by trace description legislation. That's not safety of drugs. If it's damaging, then it does become under safety of drugs. And on medications and toiletries and other preparations. Um, it's very interesting the way, um, I think there's a particular key area, what's called sort of nutraceuticals, things that, you know, vitamins and other things that aren't drugs but claim to be drugs, but they're, they're not covered by this kind of legislation. Um, and if you read adverse, you can look at these things in you know, face creams, yes, wrinkled anti wrinkles is a great one, you know. 90% of women found, and you find that there's 28 women being interviewed, because it would be a little asterisk, and if you look under at the bottom, I always look at the small print in, I love looking at adverse, and um, you look at the small print and you think, how can it be 90% of, you know, there's half a woman somewhere, there's you know, two minds or whatever, it, 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 <coughs> but things like that are um, trade descriptions and um, trade legislation, not safety of medicines. Something we, like, fer like you see the adverts for ferroglobin, the, um, the vitamins, well woman, well man, that's not medicines, that's separate. Yeah. 
It's not. There, there have been moves to actually incorporate to provide legislation, and I think there's still moves to actually bring that to have new legislation to cover that whole area, because it's very. Some of it is very, very dubious indeed, and I think it also appeals to vulnerable people. That's a big problem. But then you know you're getting like um, I look at adverse uh, Botox and you know people into in, injecting botulinum toxin into their cells. I mean, that, that I think that would might be one of the things that in 300 years people are thinking. That was really crazy. Um, so we had a look at some of the drugs uh, today that have sort of long-term um, negative effects on patients that use them. Um, what methods are there in place today that um, uh, the drugs that we're currently giving out that kind of uh, that test those sort of long-term effects without having the sort of the, the hindsight of having a patient take them for sort of 30, 40, 50 years? It's really difficult. Uh, one of the people, um, it's Alan Parks, who was involved in the development of the contraceptive pill in the 1950s, late 1950s, early 1960s, when people were very concerned about the safety of the contraceptive pill, was asked almost exactly the, question, the same question. He said he didn't think that the, the contraceptive pill could be, could be prescribed to anybody until enough women had been on it for long enough to say that there weren't any side effects, i.e. you've got to give it and wait and find out. That's the big problem. And one of the issues about testing, clinical testing, clinical trials, is an awful lot of clinical trials when they come into phase, well, phase one healthy volunteers, phase two ill people, people with the condition that the, the drug is being tried for, that suddenly when you do <coughs> phase one trials, it's usually the volunteers are often young. There's a pre preponderance of males um, students, of, uh, students. It is often medical students who volunteer for trials, and that is still a problem that a lot of drugs are tested on, predominantly young people. Drug companies will set up trials for older people, but pu older people doing trials on older people is terribly difficult because of polypharmacy. If you get somebody, an older person, they're probably already taking two or three other drugs, so trying to look at the effects of one particular compound it's incredibly complicated. And the other problem is, is um, say, doing animal <coughs> experiments. If you want to do animal experiments, say, you know, keep a, a mouse or a rat until they're in their, you know, close of their mouse or rat 80 or whatever, that's incredibly expensive to keep mice in sterile conditions for three, four years. But again, it works out very expensive. And you have the same problem because you've got other degenerative diseases going on. So you're, you've got very noisy background, all sorts of different things going on. It doesn't mean to say it can't be done and shouldn't be done, but it's very much harder and very much more expensive. I think people are probably ready for some drugs of, of a different kind. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well, which is exciting. So I'm going to give a little round of applause first.